In the last video, we learned that while vectors can be thought of as arrows in space, we can also represent vectors using components, which are the unique coefficients used to describe the vector as a linear combination of vectors in a particular basis. Even though these two concepts are quite different, they are both valid ways to manipulate vectors. So what actually is a vector anyway? That is what we will answer in this video. This video is a part of From Zero to Geo, a series where we formulate geometric algebra, an incredibly powerful branch of mathematics, from the ground up. So what is a vector? You might think that we've already answered this question. Vectors are arrows in space, right? However, if you were to ask a mathematician what a vector is, this is not the answer that they would give you. The reason for this is that one of the major breakthroughs in modern math was the switch from thinking in terms of objects to thinking in terms of properties. Traditionally, when doing math, we start with an object and then find the properties of that object. However, in modern math, we often switch this around. Instead, we like to start with a property and then find what objects satisfy this property. In light of this idea, instead of asking, what is a vector, we should instead ask, what can we do with vectors? So what can we do with vectors? Let's use our experience with arrows to figure this out. We know that we can add vectors together, and we also know that we can multiply vectors by scalars. Notice that we can actually do quite a bit with just these two operations. We can form linear combinations, which also allows us to talk about things like spans and bases. We can actually do quite a bit with just addition and scalar multiplication. From this, because mathematicians care about what we can do with objects more than what the objects actually are, mathematicians simply define vectors as anything that can be added and scaled. Now because the job of a mathematician is to make simple things complicated, this isn't quite the definition that they use. They say that a vector is anything that can be added and scaled that also follows all of these algebraic rules. Notice that to satisfy these conditions, we also need to have a zero vector and have the definition of the negative of a vector. If we have a set that has operations that satisfy these conditions, we call that set a linear space. This is the mathematician's answer to what a vector is. A vector is an element of a linear space. Many people use the term vector space instead of linear space, but I prefer linear space because the word vector is used for too many things already. Also, to be more general, mathematicians usually allow scalars to be more than just numbers. We won't need to be that general here, so we will always assume that scalars are real numbers. Now if you haven't come across this idea before, where we define something in terms of the operations you can do on it, it might not be totally clear what's going on here. Thus, let's look at several examples of linear spaces to get familiar with it. The first example is what we have been looking at this whole chapter, that is, arrows in space. We've seen how to add arrows in space and how to scale them, and because these operations satisfy the necessary conditions, arrows form a linear space. Thus, we call arrows in space vectors. Let's look at a different example. Think about numbers. We already know how to add numbers, and we can multiply a number by a scalar by just doing normal multiplication. These two operations satisfy the necessary conditions, so numbers form a linear space. Thus, because numbers are elements of a linear space, numbers are vectors. It might seem strange to call numbers vectors, but since numbers can do pretty much everything vectors can, it makes sense to call them vectors because mathematicians only care about what we can do with objects. Thinking of numbers as vectors can be very useful at times, and we will do so in a few different places in the future. Now in the last video, I said that in this video we would see that saying that vectors are lists of numbers is just plain wrong. To see this, let's take a closer look now at lists of numbers. Notice that if we have two lists of numbers, we can add them by adding the individual numbers. Furthermore, we can multiply a list of numbers by a scalar by multiplying each number by that scalar. You can verify that these definitions of addition and scalar multiplication satisfy the necessary conditions, so lists of numbers form a linear space. Thus, lists of numbers are vectors. Hey wait, didn't I say that vectors are not lists of numbers? That's the title of the video! But notice that I'm saying that lists of numbers are vectors, 
not that vectors are lists of numbers. It's still true that vectors are not lists of numbers. What we see is that lists of numbers are just one particular example of vectors among many. It's similar to how 3 being a number doesn't mean that every number is equal to 3. Thus, saying that vectors are lists of numbers is wrong because there are many things that are vectors that are not lists of numbers. And, while it is true that lists of numbers are vectors, because they don't have any geometry inherent in them, I am going to stop talking about lists of numbers entirely. These have all been relatively simple examples of linear spaces. Let's look at some more interesting examples. Consider lines in two-dimensional space. We can represent lines in two-dimensional space with an equation that looks like this. For example, the horizontal line is represented by the equation y plus 2 equals 0, and the slanted line is represented by the equation minus x plus 2y equals 0. With these equations, we can define addition and scalar multiplication of lines. We can add two lines by adding the equations, which gives us a new line. We can scale a line by multiplying the equation by a scalar. Now it turns out that scaling the equation of a line doesn't change what line it represents. However, scaling the line does affect what happens when you add it to other lines. For example, on the sum on the right, if we replace y plus 2 with 2y plus 4, the sum is this line which is slightly different from what it was previously. Anyway, we have seen that we can add and scale lines, and you can verify that these definitions satisfy the necessary conditions, so lines are vectors. I had originally planned to talk about this linear space more, but there is so much to explore that I decided to make a bonus video that should come out soon after this one. This linear space has many interesting properties, and it is very important when doing PGA, so I would suggest watching the bonus video when it comes out. Now the last linear space that I want to look at in this video is one that is a bit more unusual. Consider functions. Given two functions f and g, we can add them by adding their outputs. We can also scale a function by a scalar by multiplying the output by that scalar. It's simple to verify that these definitions of addition and scalar multiplication satisfy the necessary conditions, so functions are vectors. Now using this whole space at once is often not that useful. However, there are many subspaces of the space of functions that are useful. One example that you are probably familiar with is polynomials. We know that adding two polynomials produces another polynomial, and multiplying a polynomial by a scalar produces another polynomial, so polynomials are a subspace of the space of functions. In fact, looking at this expression here, we see that it looks like a linear combination. It turns out that the set containing every power of x is a basis for the space of polynomials. One interesting thing about this basis is that it is an infinite set, unlike all bases that we have seen previously in other spaces. These are the strange kinds of things that can happen in spaces made of functions. Function spaces are also useful in more advanced parts of calculus such as functional analysis and differential equations, which ends up causing them to be useful throughout physics and engineering as well. Now, I will admit that this is a very abstract topic. We won't need to be this abstract in the future, which is why I haven't made any exercises in this video. There are three main reasons why I decided to introduce this topic here. First, it is important to remember that vectors don't have to be arrows, lists of numbers, or really anything concrete. While I will always be working with particular examples of linear spaces in this series, it's important to recognize that in other contexts you can work with vectors without referencing any particular linear space. Second, in geometric algebra, there are several different things that form linear spaces. While they are all concrete objects, it is useful to be able to use the same terminology in each case. For example, in the next chapter we will come across multivectors, which also form a linear space. I want to be able to talk about things such as a basis for multivectors while still being understood. Third, as I mentioned in the introduction to this series, there are other flavors of geometric algebra. One of the two main things that distinguishes the different flavors is which linear space we start with. In VGA, we start with the space of arrows that we have been exploring throughout this chapter. However, in two-dimensional PGA, we use the space of lines discussed earlier in this video. Now, in light of these last two points, I want to pose a new question. What do we mean in the context of geometric algebra when we say vector? For now, 
we are going to go back to just using the term vector to describe arrows. While we are going to be finding examples of other linear spaces, we're going to be using new words to describe them, such as multivector. In Chapter 5, we will start to look at other linear spaces and what geometric algebra looks like with them, but we will still use the word vector to describe one particular space. At this point, we have learned most of the basics of vectors that we need to do geometric algebra. However, before moving on, I want to discuss a couple more things that we can do with vectors that will be useful to know. In the next video, we will look at how to describe the dimension of a space, and we'll see how we can use this to describe spaces of more than three dimensions.